Hey, good afternoon everybody and thank you so much for joining me on today's Lunch and Learn episode 20. Woo! So excited, 20 episodes already. Wow, I'm actually very excited. Um, when I started doing this, uh, gosh, now I guess four weeks ago, oh my gosh, a month ago, I was so excited just to the concept of you know, being able to just share some insight and tips with everybody. And um, I did my first one and I was like, wow, this is exciting and the response was good. So 20, thank you guys who have encouraged me and followed me and shared the videos with anybody. Um, so today we're gonna talk about the um, how your circumstances do not predict your outcome. And I think so many people uh, wanna have a victim mentality. And um, it just drives me crazy because, um, and we've talked a lot about excuses, but it just drives me crazy because, you know, somebody out there who has it worse than you is succeeding anyway, right? And um, you can make excuses or you can make progress and money or you can, uh, but you can't do both, right? So um, I want to tell you guys, I want to tell you a story that I wrote a while ago. It's one of my favorite stories. And I call it the tale of two distributors. And let me pull it up here right quick. So the tale of two distributors. Now I'm gonna call them Jane and Jill. Excuse me, sorry, just getting my whoop, getting my notes here. So I wrote this a while back. Because it drives me crazy that you could literally have two people in the same company, in the same city, in the same era, in the same age group, with the same network, and you could have completely different results. So we're gonna call them Jane and Jill. Now I want you to listen very carefully to the story. Jane, com Jane complained, we'll call her complainer Janer. Jane complained from the start, nobody was there to help her. The person who signed her up was never around, never answered her calls, Never sent out emails or texts letting her know about, you know, anything going on in the company. Never showed up at events and Jane felt very alone. Nobody went to her house to teach her how to do parties. Nobody got on the call. She wasn't available for three-way calls for her. She um, never showed up at the big events. She kind of went into the, you know, I should call it the uh, sponsor <laughs> enroller protection program. Never gave Jane any direction just signed her up and went dark. And Jane was very frustrated. She felt alone, abandoned, you know, discouraged. All she ever posted about was her discontentment, how um, you know, her upline was just scarce and making money off of her um, for doing nothing. Her social media posts were negative. They were bashing, they were cold. She never signed anybody up. She never learned a thing because nobody ever taught her. Nobody taught her to go in her back office. Nobody taught her the comp plan. Nobody taught her about the product or service they were selling. You know, nobody uh, taught her how to go log in her back office. Nobody told her where the resource library was or the flyers or you know, the calendar for events. She never had any success, felt like a failure, and finally quit. Her attitude about MLM was bitter and she was done with it. Those things don't work, okay? So then, there was Jill. Hang on, I'm gonna sip my coffee here. Jill lived in the same town as Jane. <clears throat> she had the same sponsor as Jane, so the same enroller. So Jill lived in the same town, had the same enroller, um, the same time. Like they were enrolled on the same day and the same time by the same person, in the same town and the same date. Jill was so elated by the opportunity that lied before her. Soon after she signed up, she logged into her back office, started reading, learning, printing everything, watching every possible video. She found all the conference calls and events. She attended every one of them, sat in the front row, took notes, asked questions. You know, everywhere she went, she asked people about their story, what their experience was like. She read the comp plan cover to cover until she understood it and learned it so she could teach it. She knew all her products inside and out, what made them great, you know, all the ingredients, all the features, all the benefits, 
you know, whatever she sold, the services, her widget, she knew it inside and out. She sat front row at every training and learned from the dozens of massively successful people in her company. She never saw her enroller again, never thought twice of it, just thought she must have something going on in her life. She reached out until she found people who would connect with her and support her. Whether they were there or not, she was determined. She never heard from her sponsor, but that was not going to stop her. She saw it. Her mindset was positive, constantly posting stories having about having great conversations, you know, great product results, great victories, celebrating her team's success. And she got some momentum, put her first few customers in, put her first few distributors in, dug down deep and helped them. And it was awesome. She loved it. Thought it was the best industry. She went on to become a top earner, a respected leader, and built a huge organization. So, how could these two distributors turn out so differently? They lived in the same town, the same time, the same company, the same products, the same compensation plan, and the same sponsor. When both Jill and Jane were interviewed, unbeknownst to each other, they said, why, the interviewer said, why did your business turn out this way? Surprisingly, they both provided the exact same answer. How could it have been any different being sponsored by a person like that? Right? How could it be any different? So guys, your, your destiny is not in your circumstance. Your destiny is in your attitude. Your destiny is in your... Um, what you choose it to be, right? It's not our lives that shape us, but our beliefs to what those events mean. Like, have an attitude that life doesn't happen to you, life happens for you. Every day, when something difficult happens or, you know, something challenging arises, I say, this isn't happening to me, this is happening for me, what can I learn from it? You know, there are always going to be obstacles, there's always going to be hurdles, there's always going to be things that are out of our control. And, you know, so in the story, one person use this as a reason to quit. Why? Because they probably didn't want to learn and grow. They probably didn't want to do what it took. They probably weren't ready, right? They were looking for a handout. There's so many people out there that are always just looking for a handout. Well, I'll, I'll, you're, the only hand you're ever going to ha have waiting for you is at the end of your arm, right? So one, you know, used it for motivation to quit and one used it as motivation to soar, right? So, <clears throat> you know, when people ask me, you know, what they should do or they don't have support or they don't have this or, you know, they just don't have that right tool or whatever the excuse is and, you know, they, they feel discouraged, I say, you know what, let me ask you a question. Do you love your company? Oh my gosh, I love my company. Do you love the products or services you sell? Oh my gosh, they're the best in the world. Do you believe them? Yes. Do you believe everyone needs them? Yes. Okay, well then let me ask you this. You know, because, oh, and, and by the way, like, you know, oh, my upline's not there. They don't, you know, they're scarce. They quit. They're checked out. They're on vacation all the time. Whatever it is, you know, I don't take that excuse from anyone, whether you're on my team or not. Um, does anyone else keep losing me? Because I actually was like, put my phone in airplane mode. I connected to 5G. Like, I did everything I could because I didn't want a bad connection. Hopefully, it's just your phone, not mine. Um, but we... Oh, I lost my train of thought now. Ooh. Anyway, um, I lost my train of thought. Sorry, I shouldn't be reading the comments. <laughs> anyway, um, so I'll just jump around. So we always, oh, oh so the, back to the person. I don't have any upline support. And I say, okay, well, listen, listen to this. What if you, everybody in the company disappeared right now or quit? What if you were asked to be the master distributor? Would you do that? Yeah. Do you think you'd have great success? Oh my gosh, yes. If you were the master distributor of your company, would you have success? Oh my gosh, yes. And I say, well, that's the difference between you and me. Because when I join, I am the master distributor for my team. Because everybody that I recruit will be underneath me. And they'll be underneath you. So everybody who's taken is already taken. They're still hundreds of millions of people in your own country that have never joined. So you are the master distributor. See, the difference is I've never looked up because it's not my upline's business. I mean, well, it is, but it's my business. This is like this, this circle that you signed up on, you know, you draw circles. The top one has your name in it. It's your paycheck. It's your legacy. 
It's your business. It has never dawned on me to, you know, not take 100% complete control of my business. It's my business. So it's like, if you would be the master distributor, why would you have any more advantage if you were the master distributor than if you build it where you are right now? There, that doesn't even make sense to me. Whether there's anybody above you or nobody above you does not change what your opportunity is to build below you. So you are the master distributor. You are. Everything that comes into your organization, being number one, that do you know that is the hardest job? Being the master distributor is a thousand times harder than coming into a company with thousands of distributors. Why? Because when you're first, you don't even know if it's going to work. You don't know if your products or services are going to deliver the results that you want. You don't know that you know people are going to like it. You don't know if the company can keep up with your demand. You don't know if the, the people are going to make money. You have no idea. It's unforeseen. And so when you go into a company, that's why I never would ever go into a startup because you they may not ever start up. I made that mistake. My second company was a startup and it never started up. And so you are in a better position because whether you're first and you're asked to be the master distributor, which sounds really exciting, it's not. It's hard work because you have to go recruit everyone. Well, bottom line is you have to recruit everyone where you're at right now. And that's the difference that I have in, uh, in, with most people is that when I come in to a company, my goal is I have to recruit and build my team as big as I want it because it has nothing to do with, a, you know, I don't ask for handouts. I will never have a person placed in my downline from my upline. 100% of my team is enrolled by me and my team, 100%. I have no spillover. And I have nearly 12,000 people on my team in 13 months. So don't tell me <laughs> that you have a disadvantage. You have the same advantage. Now, do I believe all companies are equal? Heck no. I do not believe all companies are equal. I believe there, there are companies that pigeonhole hold demographics. Like I, I love jewelry. But I would have never joined a jewelry company. And this is, I'm sorry if you're a jewelry company. I think it's great. I have a lot of friends that are very successful. But I personally wouldn't do it because I feel like you're literally cutting off one half of the demographic, which is men. Men don't buy women's jewelry. Well, most of them don't. So that is, when I'm, when I'm looking at an opportunity, I'm thinking, how big is my market? Who is my potential customer? And if any large portion of the population is cut out, like if you're selling something that only Gen Yers want and baby boomers don't, that would be a really bad idea considering that baby boomers control 77% of the wealth in the United States. So it might be a good idea to have something that baby boomers like, a product they like, a service they like, a technology they like, right? So, you know, think about your market. But the bottom line is, is there's so many people in your company having success, unless you're the master distributor. And if you are, then congratulations, you have a lot of work to do. So, you know, when, when I first got in, you know, the company and failed miserably, you know, nine years ago, I failed miserably for 90 days. I never said, oh, well, it's not working out. I can't do it. Or it isn't for me. I watched the people who were having success. And the only thing I ever kept saying to myself is, if they can, then it's possible. Why not me? So your attitude about your circumstances are going to dictate whether you're successful or not. Because there is somebody succeeding in your company, I promise you. And all you need to do is follow them, find out what they're doing, and duplicate that success over and over and over again. And then when you figure it out, um, you know, it. you don't have to be a great upline, so, but it's, it was gonna help people. I mean, sure, if Jane had help, she might have been uh, had a different outcome. But the bottom line is, is, Maybe she wouldn't have, right? Your circumstance does not predict your outcome. Your attitude does. Your um, behavior does. Your level of commitment does. Your goals, your self-discipline, that is going to um, dictate your success more than anything. So don't look up for help. 
I mean, it's great, sure, if you have mentors. Like, I love my enroller. She's a great mentor. She's an author. I have great respect for what she's done. And if I need something higher level and I've exhausted all my resources and somebody at corporate is not available, I might send her a text to ask her a question. But I've probably sent her less than five texts. Now, that doesn't mean I don't want to support my team. I'm actually an incredibly supportive upline to everybody in my team from anywhere down in my organization on my big leg, my small leg, my middle leg, my all legs. I'm very incredibly um, helpful because I do think that you can have an edge. And if someone is reaching up for mentorship, I absolutely want to help them. But I'm talking to you as person to person. You have control of your finances and your success and nobody cares about your finances, your success, your legacy more than you. That you have to take the reins. You have to be proactive. You have to be committed. You have to stop making excuses. You have to say, if it is to be, it's up to me. Now, of course, all, all of um, you know, great leaders would love to mentor. And there's nothing better than going out and figuring it out Going out, I would say climb the mountain and then come back down and keep teaching people how to climb that mountain, right? The the true reward in network marketing isn't getting there yourself. It's helping other people get there. It's spending, the, you know, I've already got there, right? I've gotten to seven figure income. I've gotten to a million dollars, you know, 900,000 a year. It's close enough. So I'm going to spend the rest of my life teaching other people how to get there. But you still... It's somebody else's, no matter how much they help you, it is your business. So I will do your calls, and my team knows that. I will do your launch calls. I will do your meetings. I will do your three-way calls. But what I tell people is, the sooner you don't need me, the quicker your business is going to go. Like, I am there to help you. And if you really don't have the time or the initiative or the personality, I will continue to do it. But the sooner you take command of your business, the sooner you're going to fly. Leadership is when you make a decision to be responsible for the results in your team. You know, we'll teach you what to do, and I will show you. I model it every day. I've enrolled six people, and it's the 10th of the month. Personally enrolled six people, four distributors and two customers. I am, nine and a half years later, I am still in phase one. I am still prospecting. I'm still recruiting. I'm still following up. Every single day, I'm still doing what I teach everyone else to do. I'm modeling good behavior. You know, the highest form of influence is um, moral authority. It means walking your walk, and your walk talks way louder than your talk. Um, but at the end of the day, it's all up to you. And I tell my team, I said, you know, think about this as like a football game. It's crazy to me that somebody will get a prospect from their family, their friends, their network, social media, whatever, and they will get them through the videos, a presentation, a webinar, like the person has 100% of the information. And they say, and this person, I mean, I have people on my team now for a year, and they have these people through the process, and it's like they've gotten the ball all the way down the field to the one yard line, and then they just wanna give it to me to score the touch, and they're like, can you do a three-way call? And I'm like, well, what do you need from me that you can't do? Well, I, I just thought, like, have you even asked them if they're ready to start their business? No. Well, I thought you could do that. Why? Like, there's nothing more rewarding than scoring that touchdown, guys. Like, I got addicted to that early on. Like, I, I just, you know, just remember that, yes, I'll, I'll do the, the three-way calls 100 generations deep in my team. But let me just tell you this. When I close somebody or meet with them and they enroll with me, I'm the one that's giving them my word that I will help them. I'm going to run with them. I'll be on your calls. I'll be in your living room. So that's your business partner. You did the work. This is your prospect. This is who you're going to build with. Stop asking the person above you to close it. Score the touchdown. You know, learn, you know, paint the vision. So after like five or six three-way calls, you really shouldn't need any more. Like learn. I just went, I didn't have an upline, which is, you know, probably, I had one, obviously, but I didn't have an upline near me. 
in, in my first company, because my, my, I was enrolled by my stepsister, who was enrolled by my stepbrother, who was enrolled by a guy that he worked with, and 13 generations up was our nearest leader. And she came into town probably once every couple months, especially when we started building. But I didn't have her um, in my backyard. She wasn't, do you know that in my first company, $460,000 earned in two years, and I never had anybody from my upline in my living room doing a presentation. Imagine that. Because I found a meeting, and I went for six weeks in a row, and I sat in the very first row, and I took notes, and I took notes, and I came home, and I typed up those notes, and you know what I kept thinking is, that lady is the front of the room, and she's making all the money. So my, my thought was, I better get into the front of her room quickly. That's my thoughts, you guys. I didn't say... I'm going to ask her. She was way up in my upline and I didn't realize that. But I was on her big leg in a binary. When you know binaries, um, which I don't recommend, by the way. <laughs> a little shameless plug on binaries. But um, she was way up in my upline. But I never dawned on me to ask her to do a call for me. Why would I do that? She's busy. She's making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. But I brought people to her meetings, right? Because she had open meetings and I, I brought her and she did ask me like the second week, she's like, whose team are you on? And I said, I'm on so-and-so's team. She goes, oh, okay, well, you're in my team. I'm like, oh, well, if I wasn't, I wouldn't be allowed. But anyway, um, and then I, I I got my notes together. And guys, I know you, uh, several of you see me, you know, after nine and a half years, I was horribly, deathly afraid of speaking in front of a room, like broke out with hives. Like it was so bad. I mean, I will, I will introduce you to someone someday. I'll do an interview someday with a girl, the, one of the very first girls, women that I worked with in my first company, and she will tell you I wasn't good. But you know what I was? I was willing to keep doing it bad because I was having results. And I took those notes with a dumb video, as an eight-minute video, plus those notes and a whiteboard, which I, by the way, do like. One a month, and hey, if you enroll, we'll have 4,000 people, and it was working for me. I toted that whiteboard and those notes and that little DVD in the living rooms every single week. And because I did that, because I took initiative and I took the reins of my business, I got to 35,000 a month in 15 months with no prior experience in the industry. So... I know there's many people on my team who watch these, and you guys know I love you and I'm going to help you. I want nothing more, though, for you to say, um, we're here as partners, we're here as leaders, but I got this. I, I absolutely got this. I know you do, Vicki. You're amazing. So I got this, right? Um, I want you all out here to know that leadership is not based on rank or income. Leadership is not just the top. There are leadership, you know, people, leaders needed at every single level of the organization, including the very first rank of your company. You need leaders. And leadership is not something you earn um, by, by, by making money or doing, um, you know, because you can get there by the top. doesn't mean you're a good leader. You can be a millionaire. doesn't mean you're a good leader. Leadership is not something that is given because you got a certain rank or you make a certain income. That's not what leadership is. Leadership is when you make a decision to be responsible for the results in your team. So, you know, you should want to help people. But John Maxwell, a great, great mentor of mine, says that more than anything, the best, the best thing you can do for long-term stability is equip people. Teach them how means, you know, I do it for you. And you watch and you take notes and I do it for you maybe two or three times. And then I do it with, with you, meaning you do some of it, I do some of it, right? Now I've got a, she's probably watching, I've got a, a extraordinary leader that came from another company and already I'm listening to her, you know, just in her first month doing our launch calls and explaining the product and I am overwhelmed with pride and excitement not for me, but for her because she has learned it. She has, you know, gone, done this with me, and now she's doing it. And because she's doing it, her organization's growing faster because it's not going to be at the mercy of my schedule. And she's extraordinarily professional and intelligent. And I am overwhelmed with joy for her because she's got it. And I and I see her, you know, pulling away from me, not needing me as much, and I'm getting sad. But then again, I will just keep 
finding the newer person, right? She was somebody I enrolled last month and I'll just keep working with the new people in her team. But equipping is, you know, I do it for you, you watch. Then you and I do it together. Then you do it and I watch. And then you do it alone. And then the fifth is you start teaching somebody else. And if you guys keep doing this and equip people over and over again, maybe I'll do a lesson on equipping tomorrow. I've got a great John Maxwell lesson on equipping. Let's, I'll, I'll see if it's enough for like a whole lunch and learn, but maybe I'll do equipping tomorrow because I, I spent $12,000 in a whole year with uh, John Maxwell and got just acres of diamonds and gold nuggets from him. So you'll be hearing a lot from that. So guys, bottom line is stop looking at everything around you as a negative and think, why do I have this situation? How is it going to make me stronger? What can I learn from it? And how can this make me a better leader? Because life is not happening to you. It's happening for you. Your circumstances are different. Now, another thing John Maxwell said is, it is not a level playing field. It isn't. It's not. Network marketing is not a level playing field. You have, you have, we have different backgrounds. Some people were emotionally abused. Some people were physically abused. Some people do really live in really small towns. Some people grew up poor, poor, poor with the poorest generations of poor, poor people. Does it make you any less disadvantaged? No, but you might have to get yourself on a bigger, you know, badder path of personal development. If you're young, you might have to build your network, you know, and your credibility. Um, if you have a negative personality, you might need to work on that. <laughs> you know, my five favorite books for people that get into network marketing are number one, how to win friends and influence people. You, this is a people business. When people say I'm not a people person, don't sign them up. Do not sign up people that are not people persons, people, people, because this is, this is a people business. And if you don't like people, you're not going to do very well. You probably should like people because in order to leave people, you must love people. And if you love them, you will want to lead them and you will want to help them. So don't, don't do this if you don't like people. Um, the second one is Think and Grow Rich, which I actually think that Master Key to Riches by Napoleon Hill is even better. Another one is uh, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life by Brian Tracy. Um, a good network marketing book is a good friend, Eric Worre, has GoPro. I would show you the pictures of these, but they're all backwards because the camera's backwards. And then one of my very favorite ones is called Go For No. It's by uh, Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. And I've had her as a guest on some of my team trainings. She's amazing. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but they're actually doing a Go For No for network marketing book that's coming out in January. And this gal right here may or may not be featured as a story in that. So I will I will tell you when that comes out and I'm sure I would love to have you know Andrea Waltz as a guest sometime on one of our Lunch and Learns or maybe I'll just teach you the principles because this book is like, it's a gold nugget and it's only 70, 74 pages. You could knock this bad boy out in like an hour and it, it this is life changing. So maybe, maybe I will teach from this, maybe tomorrow or the next day. So anyway, take control, be proactive, do not think you're a victim, somebody's doing it anyway, be proactive, I already said that, and go out and make your dreams come true because you are the one who cares about your dreams and your legacy and your income and your impact, you care about it more than anybody else, so take the reins and just... Go out and make a difference because that is going to change your life and inspire a lot of other people to change their lives. So learn and do, right? Learn and do, learn and do, learn and do. Learn, do, teach. Learn, do, teach. Learn, do, teach. Learn, do, teach your whole career. That's what you'll keep doing over and over. So get there yourself and then you know keep doing what you do and then teach other people. And that is the way to the top. So thank you guys. And I will see you tomorrow at noon. Have a great day, beautiful people.